<clears throat> Let's talk about Black Founder. Great. So why did I write the book? Um, the reason for writing the book at first was really therapeutic. I had gone through, you know, I'm a seasoned entrepreneur and I went through a pretty, a tragic loss in a sense that we summited Everest. You guys all know how hard it is to create a brand, create something that people like. And it's like we summited Everest, we, we had a exit, we were a half a billion dollar valuation and the way the deal was structured, we had a lockup period of 12 months and it imploded in less, less than that. And so I lost everything. And at first it was just, I needed to write it down because I didn't want other founders to go through and have the mistakes that I had. And that was the original idea for writing the book. Just get it, get it all down and kind of capture it. Well, we'll, we'll go through the book in a little bit more detail, but um, I, I, you know, you sp I want to cover some of the you know larger themes that come out of the book first. And there's some wonderful stories. I encourage you guys. It's a quick read and it's a fun read. But there's also some lessons in there too. So you spoke at our panel at Rise four years ago. Um, where uh, we talked about the, the lack of availability of funding for uh, diverse founders. And that video is on our website. It's, it hits, it, it's still one of our most frequently hit videos and, and viewed videos. It's a, it's a very powerful panel. It was a great group of people. Um, how, do we, how do we improve that climate and that environment for funding for diverse founders? You know, there's this analogy that um I always, so just the stats, a lot of you probably know it. So 1% of VC capital goes to African-American founders. Uh, and that was the name of the panel, the, the real 1%. Yeah. And then a total of 3% goes to women and minorities combined. So it's only 3%. Um, and the belief when George Floyd died, you heard a lot of people creating diverse funds, and all of those funds were around 10%. But notice the number did not increase and go up to 10%. It's still sitting at 3%. And um, so my, my, I, I always look at the sports industry, and I think that what, what they were able to do there was they said if someone can run fast, catch a ball, score points, and win, pay them, right? And have them on the team. And I think that I choose to not believe it's racism, but I think it's a, um, I look at it as a, 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 a mental bias in a sense that everybody's under pressure to deliver. And there's the go-tos, which school, did you drop out of college because you write code? You look like this. And those are just those quick go-tos that people do. I think over time, it gets better where there are more, you know, like Simeon and others in the room that are creating funds that they are the ones who are starting to change that game. And I think ownership and the power to make decisions and more and more and more people in that position is really what's going to change it over time. And we're starting to see that happen. And so I really also applaud seeing so many, you know, funds with people of color running them. And I think that's going to make a big difference. Yeah, I, I interviewed Scott Kapoor, who's the managing general partner of Andreessen and Horowitz a few years ago. And he made the point that as you said, you need to hire somebody for the CTO job or you need a new investment professional in your fund. Often you, there's an unintentional bias where you go to your old networks, Stanford Business School, you know, the people you know, and, and it, 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 I think it presents a barrier at times for people of color trying to get across those networks. And if you're an investor, uh, you have to really be, and I like the, Derek Lewis's word for this, you have to be intentional about getting out of those your comfortable zones and into other zones where there are talented, creative people that could benefit your organization. Yeah, and in the NFL was one of the first that actually for new positions that opened, they some of the teams started to make it mandatory that you had to interview different people and open it up. Um, and I think that the VC world is where sports sports were back in the fifties. Um, so you had. Jackie Robinson and you had some others 
And that's how far back we are. Because when we think about it, it's in just the last 20, 30 years, venture capital wasn't a thing. And so it's still early, but it has a lot of analogy that the sports industry had to overcome and, and deal with as well. So I, I think we'll get there, but it's slow going. Yeah, that's a, uh, the Rooney rule for my favorite team, the Steelers. So I, I, know, I know all about that. Um, so let's talk about another feature or theme in your book. Uh, the subtitle of your book is called The Hidden Power of Being an Outsider. Can you elaborate on what, the, what advantages there are to being an outsider? Yeah, I, I, I love all of the different presentations that were done over the last couple of, uh, uh, yesterday that we got to watch. And so many people were small. I, I didn't see anybody who was a captain of industry who went down, right? And so everybody who was presenting had a unique point of view because they, when, when um, the, the mapping of the ocean floor, for example, the point of view was from a completely different point of view than the way other people have done it. That's an outsider's advantage. And so, you know, one of the things that I also try and tell diverse founders is you have a unique view on this marketplace and you have an audience that you are backed into that you can also bring to the table. And so those give you advantages that you may not realize. Um, so you kind of have to put your blinders on and you got to look at it from a unique perspective and that being that, okay. So I, I had been in the movie industry. Even today, there are no black or Latino, there's no minority theater owners in the US market, right? And there's no people of color who run studios. So, but yet we make up 30 to 40% of all ticket sales, and there's no decision making in there. So I'm a diverse founder who goes to the movies, grew up, my daughter goes to the movies with me too. And the point being is I have a unique point of view about how to approach the industry that other people just didn't because they didn't come up in that way. And that gives you an insight. And so I remember walking into the the uh, meetings of the movie studios when Blackberries were still big, and I said, this is where everyone's gonna make their decision. And they're like, no, it's gonna be Fandango and Movie Phone. You know, they're never gonna do that. And I said, no, no, everything's gonna be done on this, and people laughed at me. But it was that point of view of me working at Sony and knowing some physical hardware tech that, no, you could see it coming. And so you have an outside advantage for that. And that's where innovation never comes from the top. It always comes from below. Well, speaking of innovation in the movie industry, we heard from Sarah Nagy last night about CKI, and, um, and that's all very exciting. It's, we have a little investment in that in Ark and Rock, and we really are excited to be a part of that. But how will AI affect the movie industry? That's, that's a great question. Uh, all right, so we all see the news. Everybody says AI is going to be writing scripts. Uh, did you guys see CNN today that there's this backlash that they use for the new, um, uh, in, in the Avengers series, uh, Nick Fury, uh, which is um, Samuel Jackson's character, uh, has a new series that's on Disney+. Plus. And they use AI to create the opening sequence. And people are, you can look at it later, but people are all upset about that. And um, so I think there's fear mongering, but here's the thing that's so cool. You can't change storytelling. And if your stories don't connect with people, it really doesn't matter. And so when I, when I was watching the most recent Avatar, I kept saying to myself, none of this is real, right? It's all, it's all high tech, it's all computer generated, and yet James Cameron knows how to tell stories that connect with us, so I don't care at, at the end of the day. But the fear of are we gonna lose jobs or are things, I think we've heard this before where um, 
I think Henry Ford said, if I asked people what they wanted back then, they would have said a faster horse and buggy. They didn't want a car. And I think that the innovation creates new jobs and new things. Um, we do need to go slow and do it the right way. But I still think connecting and being able to tell stories, if we're the audience, we're going to need to be able to do it. And it's a new tool, but I don't think it's going to replace everything. Well, let's talk about some specific technologies. What about the impact of the metaverse with Apple Vision and the MetaQuest 3? How is that going to affect the industry? So I, I love playing with this stuff. And, um, you know, it's amazing because you can, you can sit in your home and feel the feeling of an IMAX, right? So that capability is already here. But... Did anybody go see the movie Nope in theaters? Did anybody see it? Okay. So if you go see a horror movie with a bunch of people versus watching it at home, it's a totally different experience. When you're in an auditorium with 300 people and they're like, run, bitch, run, you know. <laughs> it's not the same when you're sitting on your couch or in the front row. They're like, see, I knew he was going to die. I knew it. You didn't know he was going to die. Yes, I did. I said, and, and it's just, it's not the same. And so I love going to see a movie with an audience where you get to really get that feedback loop. Um, so I think VR is going to make at home wearable and big. It's not going to replace, you know, you can watch the football game on your TV. You're going to be able to have half court seats in VR, but it's not the same as when you're 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 watching you know them do their thing from half court in real life, so I, I but I think it's great. I think it's amazing stuff. So you touched on AI, uh, possibly threatening jobs. Do you think that the, that this sort of advance in AI is going to cause uh, job losses or threaten the middle class? Is there a wealth gap or inequality that could be increased? What, what are your thoughts on that? Just general late night dorm room thoughts on that. Yeah, um, one of the things that, that scares me the most is seeing um, there's this massive wealth generation that's happening unlike anything we've ever seen. And there is a uh, service class that I don't know if you're seeing it. To, did anybody see the new McDonald's that has no person in it? You drive through the drive through you place your order, and there's not even a human being. You completely go through and you check out. Um, so you see that stuff is coming. Um, the food delivery service, there are, you know, I don't think it's here as fast, but you will have, if you're outside of the city, like Manhattan's very dense, but you will have drones delivering your food, your pizza. You will have... Uh, self-driving vehicles that will come up to your house that they already are testing them on college campuses where it it drives up to the dorm you punch in the key code with your confirmation number you open it and your food comes out um, we're not making and owning that technology but we're the service class and when you displace service class with such simple robotics I think you're going to see a really big problem in this country and around the world. And so we've got to, got to get in front of some of that. Um, but when I saw that McDonald's, I remember when, when I was a kid, uh, so many people came up through fast food restaurants, right? It's your first job. You're still in high school and you get to work there. That was profound. I was like, okay, you don't need human beings. Um, that's stuff we're seeing for the first time. It's not Miso Robotics has a robotic arm that actually does all the cooking and assembles the burgers. Um, so that's that stuff's coming fast. And so my big concern is we're not teaching our kids to code and develop and be entrepreneurs as fast as we need to. And so there's a chance we may be left in this gap that uh, a robot is going to be cheaper to take some of those jobs. You know, we're not adapting with it fast enough that you're not going to have, 
you know, uh, don't get mad, don't protest, don't try and shut things down, uh, leapfrog and become part of the innovation, um, teach your kids how to code, um, teach, teach them how to be entrepreneurs, teach them how to raise capital and fund the right types of businesses and create uh, family and interge intergenerational wealth. One of the reasons why I wrote this book, and we made sure to write it um, at a level there's there's no bad language in it, but because we do want middle school and high school to be able to read it, and we tried to make it somewhat a blueprint um, about, okay, I need to be part of the, being a founder even didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. So being creators of things that you can have an equity stake that can uh, create value, anybody can look at a problem and help solve it. And you can do it in your own neighborhood. And if you can solve it in your neighborhood, then the world needs it. But we need to know how to use those tools that we can go and create those things and more and more kids are in middle school and high school and they're able to create apps that are solving problems in their bedroom. And that's part of where we need more innovation. Here, here. here. <laughs> so let's go back to MoviePass. What would you have done differently in MoviePass 1.0 or could have done differently? I don't know that we could have done anything differently. Um, we did it by the letter, and it was just the perfect storm um, of a bunch of things going wrong. And, um, you know, there, there really wasn't... So to give you an idea about the Capitol, and Ed was there, so he got to witness this. We were struggling raising additional capital. And myself and my co-founder, Hame, were both very successful black executives. And he was from uh, up, up front, and he um, was a very successful VC. I had grossed more than $3 billion in the marketing of properties that I had been involved with. So we're, we're successful guys, and yet we were bumping up into the ceiling. And so finally, when we got this buy offer, to give you an idea, we couldn't raise an additional 10 million. And yet, within 60 days, the guys who took it over raised 125 million in 60 days. And they're two white guys. And they didn't even have the same track records with certain things that we did. And they were able to raise the capital. Um, and so I think just because you're early and you're a pioneer in a space, you're going to get the daggers in the back. And so um, I wrote the book to kind of say, here are things to watch out for. Here are things you can do to kind of potentially offset that chance of not getting access to that capital. Here's how you can staff up your team and certain people around you. Um, you sometimes need additional color coming in that room with you. It helps. Because um, it, it makes the people across the table sometimes feel comfortable. Um, and so those are some of the tips and things, and it'll change more over time. But uh, I, I don't know that I could have changed anything, but I know I'm happy to see and writing this book and putting it out there and seeing even at this conference, it is starting to change, you know. Uh, when the publisher was looking at it, they said they couldn't find another black tech founder book. They said there wasn't a single one that they could find. Sure, you have rappers and you have, you know, athletes, athletes and things like that, but there was no black tech founder books. And so we need more books too. Let's talk about the documentary for a little bit. Um, so, uh, after everything crashed and burned, um, Business Insider written an article about, it was literally called The Rise and Fall of Movie Pass. And um, Business Insider- It's is, a good article. Yeah, right. it's, it's, it's a definitive article. So Business Insider then did a deal with 
I want to say CAA, they optioned it, and then um, ultimately Mark Wahlberg's company got involved, and they decided, they came to me and they said, we need uh, to option your, your rights. We can't just start, we could make it without you, but we just don't think it'll be as good. And would you be willing to option it? And I felt, yes, because I want to at least get the truth down. And um, so gave them a 12-month option, and they moved pretty quickly. They started shooting it. Uh, he's got a back-end deal with HBO. And so they've gotten everything in the can, and they're doing some final edits. Um, I talked to the director this past week, uh, and it's right now potentially going to premiere in Sundance and then air on the channel in January. That's right That's now great. the time takes. That's great. You should also check out the, uh, the article on Time on, that featured Stacy right around the time he relaunched uh, MoviePass 2.0 too. It's, it's a good article. So um, let's go back to how this all came about because I, I, that, was, that was what I found so fascinating. Just I didn't know your origins. We, we've been together for a long time, talked a lot, but I had no idea like, how much chance you took. I mean, you were born an entrepreneur. So let's just go back to the, to the beginning. I, I know your, your parents were b very big on education. Your, I think your dad was a professor. Um, your mother Prince, He was a principal. Principal, that's right. And, and your mother uh, would expect you to, get, uh, to go to college and get a degree. How did you get your start in show business, um, going back to the time you, you first left home? And when was that? Uh, so I, I always knew I wanted to. So I knew I wanted to be in whatever that was when I was, I think I was 10 or 11. And I sat in the theater and I saw Blade Runner. Star Wars was very impressive. But Blade Runner did something to me that I said, I want to do that, you know? I didn't know what that was, right? And um, I felt like I couldn't really tell my parents. Um, as as um, Ed said, my dad was a principal. Um, my mother was, she ran uh, an employment agency and they, they both went to Grambling, so they were first generation being able to go to college and they both went to HBCUs. And we were having, when we were eating dinner, we were talking about that look your parents give you when you come up with something crazy that you say. And um, so I, I, in high school, I said to my, I decided I was going to skip a year, and I was going to go to Los Angeles, and I was going to make it, and I was going to be a star. And so uh, my... <laughs> My, I tell my father in the kitchen, and I said, Dad, I'm, 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 I'm going to move to Los Angeles. I'm going I'm to give it a go. And he's like, how much money do you have? And I said, I've saved up $300. <laughs> and he says, OK. And I think they let me go because they figured I probably wouldn't make it to Albuquerque. <laughs> and, um, but I went, and I didn't come back. And I. I, I thought I wanted to act. I thought I wanted to be in the music side. I thought I wanted to direct. I wasn't really sure, but I just wanted to do that. I just wanted to be in that. I, seeing worlds get created like that, when you would like read a book and then see a whole world built, I just you know loved it, and I said I got to do be near that. So. So you were what, 18 at that time, something yeah, like that? I, yeah, right out of high school. So what advice would you give to the 18-year-old Stacey Spikes now? It was good to be dumb and stupid because I did things that today, if, if, if our daughter says I have $300 and I'm moving to another city, I'd be, I don't even know that I could have been as calm as the way my parents were. And... You know, I, I so I, I I think young on one of the panels, I think Buddy mentioned it about the stages when you're young and you don't have much and you can take that risk. By all means, when you're young, go for it, right? Make the mistakes and everything's learning because when the when the kids comes and the mortgage comes and all that stuff, it it slows down the risk you can take. So I'd say, you know. Take the risk. Take it when you're young. Do it all. Um, 
And if you have something that you want to do and there's a way you see the world that's different, go for it, right? Because when we look at even what Albert Einstein was writing when he was just in the patent office, right? There's so many times you look at what a teenager is thinking. In their heads is the seeds to brilliant things, and yet they have no idea, right? And when we look at Bill Gates, and when we look at Zuckerberg, and when we look at Michael Jordan, and when we look at like brilliance, it's there. But you need that courage to go do crazy things. So I don't know that I would, if I were talking to my younger self, I wouldn't say anything to him. Because he, he would, if, I wouldn't want to scare him to not try. And he might not listen anyway. He won't listen anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no. So you eventually, and after audition, the act, you see all this stuff, you eventually get to Motown, yeah. uh, which is awesome. How, how did, what formative impact did being at Motown have on your success you know, as a black executive and eventually founder? So Motown was a really rare place to be able to work. So here was one of the best known global brands that black people made and owned. And when I got there, so I, this wasn't in Detroit. Barry Gordy had sold Motown to Universal. So this is the new Motown. And um, being there and in that culture, it, it was like, oh, we can do this. We can build tops of industries. We can, and w at that time, it was an amazing time. It was, uh, here's Vibe Magazine, which was, Vibe had brought Rolling Stone, right? Uh, here's Michael Jordan, who's top of the basketball. He's literally buying other teams. Here's Michael Jackson, who's in music. Here's uh, Mike Tyson, who's top of, you know, you went across all categories. Here's FUBU, and here's Baby Fat, and here's, you could see we were doing things. And there was a confidence in the air that we were, you know, making big moves and accomplishing stuff. And being at an all black company at that time, I think helped make this guy later because he grew up in a time that you saw it happening. It was possible. This wasn't my parents coming home watching the Jeffersons in good time and you know, uh, uh, Sanford and Son dreaming of a world. We were the, the manifestation of their dreams. We were getting to do the impossible. And um, so being at Motown at that time, and then so uh, through a, a weird set of circumstances, I ended up being Boys to Men's product manager. And so my first group in the industry ends up being boys to men. And um, by the time I was 21 years old, I was representing boys to men, Queen Latifah, Eddie Murphy, Stevie Wonder, and doing Spike Lee's soundtracks. By the time I'm 21. And that's just not possible. The Hollywood Reporter had me at 30 under 30. And um, <laughs> it was like 30 under 30. And a lot of my peers, they were not starting their career path till they got out of college. So a lot of them were brushing, you know, they were 25, 26, 27. And because I went straight out of high school, I had a four year jump on so many of them. And I just didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, so it helped a lot. I was, so I was at a video company and they were uh, where we printed the boxes and it was a place called Modern Album. And it's where they also printed the album jackets. And that's where Universal print them. And there was a woman from a different company and she says, hey, I'm sure you're happy where you are, but I know that Motown is hiring, and they're really looking for people of color to give them an opportunity. And she said, you should have take your portfolio, and here's my buddy. He's head of the art department, and you should go interview. And um, 
I didn't know what a portfolio <laughs> was. And so I, uh, I, I created something and I had a little binder and I looked like I came from an ad agency and I walked in and they gave me the job on the spot. They, they offered it to me instantly and it was a gopher position. So my job in, was the album comp. So you would get a, um, a board that had the front cover of the album and the back cover of the album, and then the uh, the CD case, and they had this sticker that was on the side, and each department head had to sign off or they had to give their notes. And so my job was to route those um, comps, any feedback or whatever, and then I would go over to Universal and we would do the scheduling meeting of when it would come out and let's say, and then it had to go to the management and if the artist manager didn't like it or whatever, so my job was to route these things and then that's how I was able to slip into a product manager role because I had this relationship with Boys to Men's manager and they really liked, I, I think it was just because I was their age you know, and, and they didn't, they felt like the other product managers were parents and talking down to them. And they just, you know, so, but that's how I got the, got the job. I think when, when things get really stressful in a startup, the most vulnerable people are the co-founders. So I'd love to know how your relationship developed with MA as you went through like the glory times when everything was awesome and then the really stressful times afterwards. And then I'd love to know what, you know, uh, Movie Pass, the sequel is going to look like. Great question. I'll repeat it back. So, uh, co-founders going through stressful times and movie past 2.0. Um, yeah, it, you know, it's a marriage. Um, and so it's very stressful. Luckily, Ame and I were, so we called it shake and bake. He worked on bringing the money in, but I was largely operational. It also helped that he was in Los Angeles and I was in New York. The whole team was in New York. And we kind of, the ownership was 60-40. So when push came to shove, I had the final call. And that final call kind of made it, I think, easier for our relationship. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, we had done a, a soft launch in one market. We did San Francisco. And AMC and Mark Cuban owned Landmark. They literally came out and shut us down before we launched because they were a majority shareholder in MovieTickets.com. And we had done our API through MovieTickets. And we, we lost $2 million worth of build. So we had to rebuild from scratch as we were losing capital and um, we had to build, a pro we only had less than six months worth of runway. So we rebuilt the product that actually was a FinTech solution that allowed us to be able to let people go to any theater they wanted and, they, and any movie they wanted and the studios and theaters couldn't shut us down. And the FinTech that we had to create was all original. We had to build it from scratch. So Hime and I, didn't agree on how to relaunch. So Hame said, let's go to the studio, uh, let's go to the theaters, play nice with them, and let's launch a new market. Let's go to Dallas or something like that. And I said, no, we have the capacity to launch the whole country all at once. And I said, launch missiles on them all. And he's like, dude, that's a mistake. And I'm like, no. And we went for two or three weeks as we were getting close to, do we go one market or all? And my feeling was, if you pick a single market, the exhibitors who are dominant in that market have to say something against you. But if you go against all of them, they all can't organize to speak out against you. So Hime was like, I think you're making a mistake. I'm registering it, but you have the final call. And we launched missiles on all markets, and not a single exhibitor said a word. So that's an example, but I think sometimes when, my only experience is when power is equal, it can be corrosive. I do think you, you need somebody who has a final say, and you can blame them if it goes wrong, but don't get caught in a war because you got 
have equal power. I think you need somebody who's driving. Um, the second part, Movie Pass 2.0, the big difference is um, the first version, we had no capability of doing variable pricing. So if you wanted to go to a very expensive theater or a theater that we had partnership buying wholesale, you as a consumer couldn't tell the difference. So we kind of took a page out of companies like ClassPass's book that said, okay, I'm gonna give you credits and I'm gonna let you spend them, but I'm gonna give you optics into how we value your spending, which is if you wanna go prime time Friday night opening weekend, that's more expensive than if you wanna go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And once we switch to the credit system, and you know, Haig is here, we're already profitable where the first five years of Movie Pass One, we weren't. But now that we've aligned the consumer with our buying, they they want to go where they're going to save more credits and points. They want because they don't care that we're recording this, right? We are, yes. Oh. But I told you I'd let you edit. Uh, I won't. I won't <laughs> edit want. it. But the 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 theaters like to think that the consumer only goes to their brand. Really, it's where's Star Wars playing, what time, and how far away is it? They, they're not really going, I only go to this theater, you know? Um, and, and so we polled people and 75% of people said they'd rather one subscription plan that they can go anywhere than only have a subscription plan to one circuit. So there you go. Great. I think uh, we have time for one more. We look at movie passes like Airbnb for hotel travel and limousine, and it's this, the movie industry has no aggregators. So when you think of airlines, hotels, there is no aggregator and there's no variable pricing. When you think about that, that's crazy. So Mission Impossible and Little Art House Film is the same price, right? And so our job is to be the aggregator in the market and create a marketplace with variable pricing because the industry can't do it. it doesn't, it's not limber enough and you have so many different players, they can't do it independently with what's called the MLA, the Master Licensing Agreement, doesn't allow the theater to change the price, right? So with us, we can do that. So one day I might be hiring Tyler Perry because, you know, so. Okay. Thank you so much, Stacey. Well, that was great. We really appreciate it.